Hi, everybody. Uh, today we are going to have a guest as the main speaker, and I will be interviewing her rather than uh, me giving all the details. Uh, so, so today our guest is uh, Dr. Dulangi Dahanayake. She is a consultant child psychiatrist, and she's also a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry, University of Colombo. And she has had a wide experience in managing uh, childhood disorders, especially autism and ADH. Uh, today's talk will be on uh, ADH, or as we call uh, attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder. So over to Dulangi. Uh, Dulangi, I would like you to start off by just explaining briefly what do we mean by the term uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And also maybe explaining a little about uh, how it is, it is different in adults because adults also do have ADH. And of course, that is the territory of the adult psychiatrist. However, there is an extension from childhood, I believe. So do like you can start off by telling us, uh, explaining briefly what is uh, ADHD or ADH and uh, perhaps then go on to how we might recognize ADH. Of course, um, ADHD is a common childhood uh, psychiatric disorder. Um, it is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So there is a neurodevelopmental correlate to this disorder. And the main features that we tend to see is inability of the child to um, regulate their level of activity, sustain attention, and they also struggle with impulse control. So these are the common symptoms that we see and generally the referrals to psychiatric services are in the context of difficulties at school or getting into um, accidental injuries often um, and having trouble with friendships and maintaining their academic performance. So they have a lot of um, difficulties in these areas of their lives. And um, as opposed to childhood ADHD, adult ADHD tends to differ somewhat because the hyperactivity does not uh, appear as a prominent symptom generally. But what they mainly complain of is uh, disorganization. So they have a lot of trouble organizing their lives. They forget things. And uh, they also have trouble with their relationships and their, to regulate their work activities. So lots of uh, adults do complain of these symptoms and that is increasingly being recognized as a, a mm -hmm. disorder. However, in childhood, I think it's still more prominent and more, I mean, it tends to be diagnosed more in childhood. Mm -hmm. than well, Can adults. I just, uh, sorry for interrupting, but can I ask yes. you now, uh, we are not going to talk of adult ADHD today, but uh, is it correct to say that uh, all people who have ADHD in adulthood also had ADHD in childhood? Uh, what I mean is that a certain percentage of people with ADHD in childhood will go on to have uh, ADHD in adulthood. And also that uh, ADHD does not begin de novo in adulthood per se. Am I correct or is that? Yes, there's a lot of controversy around that. Uh -huh. um, so out of the people, with, out of the children who have ADHD uh -huh. in childhood, um, what studies have shown is that almost 75% go on to uh -huh. like have improvement in their symptoms and are okay as adults. Right. But uh, in around 25%, the symptoms might persist, especially as issues related to inattention. Okay. Right. And there is uh, increasing debate over whether adult ADHD can occur without it having been there in childhood. Right. Um, with, right. Uh, some some uh, people and some researchers uh, claiming that this is possible. However, it's right. still an area that is much debated and uh, okay. doesn't have a lot of. Uh, but I suppose even if that happens, it would be the minority. Am I right? Not the majority. Yes, definitely, because the majority right. of those would okay. have had okay. in childhood. Okay, right. Okay, Dulan, can we go on to now uh, examine a bit more in detail the symptoms 
that uh, we get in childhood because, I mean, it's not always easy to recognize it as a disease, isn't it? I mean, some of the symptoms are could be part and parcel of normal childhood uh, behavior. Yeah. In fact, people have said that there's nothing, there's no disease called ADHD and it's just a part of childhood naughtiness. So can you expand a bit more on that? Yes, it can be quite difficult to differentiate from childhood naughtiness at times because um, if we look at the normal spectrum of activity among kids, it can vary widely and it also depends on their development age. So the younger kids tend to have a higher level of activity and they are less likely to be able to control their level of activity than older kids. So there is a lot of controversy around where do we draw the line. However, I think the best indicator is the level of impairment distress. And there is uh, strong evidence to say that this disorder does exist, ADHD does exist, and there is evidence to say that it is of neurodevelopmental origin. So it's different from normal childhood naughtiness. Hmm. And how we generally differentiate is, is of course, um, usually what happens is either the parents or the teachers refer the children because they find them to be different from the others. So they identify that this level of activity is not normal for this particular age. Especially the teachers are very good at detecting it because they see a lot of kids of similar age. And what we generally see, uh, there are three symptom clusters mainly, hyperactivity, inattention and impulsivity. So as hyperactivity, we tend to see kids who just can't sit still in the classroom and they're supposed to be seated. So they just run around and then they are very fidgety and they climb uh, the, you know, the playground equipment even when they're expected to be in the classroom. So there's a lot of activity. Right. And then they can be quite inattentive. They forget their things. They tend to lose their pencils, pens, water bottles. And um, then they tend to uh, make careless mistakes in there when they're supposed to do their term tests and all. There are lots of careless mistakes and they are unable to complete their tasks. So when they are, for example, if they are to draw something, they might draw, but uh, you know, leave it halfway, not to complete right, the task. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, they right. also, yeah. yeah they're also very, carry on, uh, yes. very impulsive. They tend to... Mm -hmm interrupt other people's conversations, they tend to sort of blurt answers before, before the questions are completed and they tend and they have a lot of trouble waiting for their turn. Mm -hmm. So that those things cause a lot of problems because the teachers find it difficult to manage such children in the classroom and the parents find it difficult to keep them safe sometimes because of their hyperactivity. And their friends or the classmates might not really like them because they are very impulsive they might you know grab other people's things or be very over talkative so it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they are not very popular usually among the classmates right so they can become labeled as troublemakers and get cornered so to speak right. yes and, and also punished by the teachers because and they punished. don't finish right. their work they don't right. follow orders so they get mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. Okay, Durani. So what advice will you give, uh, I suppose, as you say, the onus of uh, kind of initially diagnosing would be on the parents and the teachers. Yes. So what advice can you give parents and teachers? Taking the parents first, shall we? Yeah. For parents, I think um, what we tend to see is that most parents have thought there is something uh, different, but uh, they feel that things might improve and have a bit of like a watchful uh, waiting period. But I think it's important for them to seek support early, seek an assessment early if they feel that there is something different about their child because um, otherwise they, if it's missed and if the child's behavior patterns tend to sort of get established and there is a lot of negative uh, input from the teachers as well as the peers, then the child's self-esteem will suffer and there will be other additional problems for the child. So, right. So I suppose, Ulangi, the extremes are more easier to diagnose rather than the milder 
cases i suppose yeah, or children i suppose yes so uh, yes yeah. so how would you as a expert how would you go about diagnosing more definitely these children when they come to you so first we do and uh, it really take a bit of history from the parents to find out what exactly has they have experienced so we ask for the symptoms of hyperactivity in attention impulsivity and what sort of impact it has had and the risks the child has faced for example some kids get into a lot of accidental injuries mm. they present frequently to their emergency department so we try to see if those things have been there and we also uh, talk to the teachers and get information from them about how the child's behavior is in the classroom and we uh, have uh, certain um, scales that we tend to use psychometric assessments that we use to ascertain whether there is a difference in their level of activity, attention, and whether they have issues in with impulsivity. And we um, also uh, do a, an observation where we can see the child doing certain activities. We can see him interacting with other children who are generally in the world setting. And uh, if we do have a lot of uh, doubt about the diagnosis, we also sometimes keep them as involved patients to observe and clarify our diagnosis, but that's usually not necessary because right. we tend to get all the information from mm -hmm. parents, mm -hmm. teachers and from our observation. Okay. Um, so are there different rating scales for teachers and uh, parents and another one for the experts, kind of? There are different rating scales. Uh, what we use in our service is uh, we use the same one for teachers and uh, the parents, but we do have a different scale that we use to uh, screen for features of ADHD. Right. Okay. Now, other than the rating scales and observation, are there any other tests that you can do? Are there any uh, laboratory tests or any other more sophisticated um, tests which are available? Not at the moment, but of course, if we do suspect there is some other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, physical cause uh, leading to the hyperactivity, we might do certain investigations, right. but that's usually not the uh, scenario we tend to diagnose on clinical grounds. Okay. Are there conditions where you can confuse, uh, conditions which you can confuse with ADH? Yes, especially... Uh, if it's of recent onset, we have to think about other problems like children with who are trying to adjust to a traumatic experience or a life experience that is difficult might mm -hmm. present with hyperactivity. Right. And uh, there might also be other problems at school which can cause difficulties for them and they might uh, present with uh, acting out. Um, the other common thing that we need to rule out is, of course, intellectual developmental disorder. Because right. children with uh, lower level uh, of lower developmental age would uh, not be able to uh, maintain attention uh, that is appropriate for an age matched peer. So we have to uh, right. try and see whether there's an element of intellectual disability or learning issues. Right. Sometimes specific right. learning disorders can also present as hyperactivity, especially in the classroom. Okay. Okay, so what you are saying is that if, uh, if there's a sudden change of behavior in an otherwise normal child or previously normal child, then it could be uh, some stressful event that, that is setting it up rather than ADH. And yes. ADH would develop gradually. Uh, however, that can still be confused with intellectual development. But in that case, there would be a kind of uh, performance, uh, lower level of performance, isn't it, uh, from the beginning? Yes. But right. um, sometimes, surprisingly, that might be missed, especially if right. it's a much right. younger child. Right. Okay. Now, uh, putting it in another way, now, do, uh, overall, are children with ADH, uh, of, uh, are they of normal intelligence or is there a percentage who are having intellectual difficulties as well uh, as a part Generally, of the disease? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, they do have normal intelligence, but of course mm -hmm. there is an association with uh, lower levels of intelligence, especially borderline uh, sort of intellectual capacity is associated with ADHD. Right. And, um, 
Yeah, and children with uh, other neurodevelopmental disorders such as intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, and specific learning disorders such as dyslexia, mm -hmm. they tend to have a higher chance of having ADHD. Right, right. So that's a kind of comorbidity as we call it. Yes, they can coexist. Both disorders yeah. might be there. 